Well, thank you very much, choir. Church, uh, good morning again. Uh, this is the season of Epiphany. Uh, we are just entering the season of Epiphany, and in case you're not familiar with the church calendar, uh, this is two millennia now of ways that Christians, Christ followers, have told the time differently than the world around them. And so we're entering into a new season. Epiphany celebrates the ways that God revealed who he was in the face of Christ. It's the epiphany of knowing God, of once dwelling in darkness and now coming and seeing his light. This is epiphany. And in Luke's gospel in particular, we see uh, that Christ is meeting and, and greeting and actually hunting down uh, these people that would have made the least likely disciples, uh, the people that we might most easily pass by. Uh, he is pursuing skeptical teenagers, foreign soldiers, grieving mothers, notorious sinners. He's pursuing the demon-possessed, the ashamed, the powerless, and even the dead. And why do we need epiphany? We need to see, brothers and sisters, that Christ is pursuing all of these who would be most easily brushed aside because in the faces of all these people that we see God pursuing, we can see the heart of God for you and for me as well. And so uh, today... Uh, we will be looking at who Christ came for, that Christ came for skeptics. Those who do not trust him easily, who don't find it uh, a simple task uh, to put their hope in him. Christ came for skeptics. But before we turn to God's word, let's take a moment to pray. Lord, I need you, and we need you. We need you uh, because without you, without your Holy Spirit, without him working amongst us and in us, these words would just be dead on a page or on a screen. We need you to animate your word, to prove it, to still be living and active amongst us, and we need you so that you would feed us your word and that it would settle deep inside of us, that it would change us from the inside out. And so we put, you, we put ourselves in your presence today, God, asking for you to move among us. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would you hear the word of the Lord, taken from Luke 5, beginning in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats and the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that the boats, they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. 
for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to start uh, with a quote uh, from one of the most fearless preachers of the gospel that we have had in our church history. Uh, His name is A.W. Tozer. He was a pastor, an American pastor, uh, but served in Toronto in the mid-20th century. And he said this, It is a tragic error to imagine a God who is distant, removed, or passive, shrouded in a mysterious cloak of heartless religion. Rather, the God of the Scriptures is working constantly to reveal His glory, to redeem His people, and to draw us to an intimate encounter with His gospel heart. Brothers and sisters, what we'll be looking at today is that God, uh, and throughout the entire season of Epiphany, that God's greatest desire that we see run throughout both Testaments is that he is desiring deeply at the core of who he is to reveal himself to people who do not know him. It's what animates him. Uh, If you could say that God woke up in the morning, it's what wakes him up in the morning. It's at the core of who he is. He desires to be known. In Psalm 27, the psalmist says to God, You have said, Seek my face. And my heart says back to you, says the psalmist, Your face, Lord, do I seek. And in the prophet uh, Ezekiel, chapter 37, he talks about a time uh, when God in the future will be entirely known, and he describes it this way. He says, I will not hide my face any more from them, God speaking about his people. And at the very beginning of scripture, in Genesis 32, going all the way back, we see uh, this liar, this thief, this con artist named Jacob. And the moment when he is running as far as he can from God, God presents himself to him and it turns his life around And this is how Jacob describes that day. He simply says, I have seen God face to face. God's deepest desire, at the very core of who he is, throughout both Testaments and now even today, what wakes him up, what animates God most, is for us to know him, to see him face to face. I had a a dorm mate, a friend in college, who was born blind. Uh, We became friends uh, throughout our freshman year, and as we became closer and closer friends, uh, he asked me something that I've never been asked before. He asked uh, if he could feel my face. He had heard me speak, he had received hugs from me, but he still wanted to know my face. And he knew that he wouldn't really know me until he could see me. And so he put his hands on my face and he felt all of the early wrinkles on my forehead and the dimples on my cheeks, and the crow's feet on my eyes. And by seeing my face, he felt he could know me. And honestly, it made me uh, really uncomfortable. I wasn't used to someone wanting to study who I was. 
in all of the simplicity, but also all of the complexities, the details of who I am. I wasn't used to that, and it made me uncomfortable. My friend knew, though, that if he was really going to know me, he had to see my face. When we see Jesus in Luke 5, we find him uh, already with a swarm of people who have been following him around the lake uh, so much that they pushed him up to the water side, uh, and so there's nowhere to go, and they're closing in, and so he makes uh, the good decision to say, you know what, maybe I should get some distance so that I can properly teach without people bumping into me, and so he gets a boat of a teenage fisherman named Simon, Peter. And he gets uh, this teenager's boat and he says, you know what, why don't you get off shore just by a little bit to create some distance between me and the crowds and I'll shout out my lesson to them at a distance. And he does. He says, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And after uh, this lesson, we don't know if it was an hour, we don't know if it was uh, a good-mannered 25-minute sermon, Uh, we don't know what it looked like, but after the lesson, after he was done teaching the crowds, what we do see is that there is this intimate conversation between Jesus and Peter. He turns to Simon, this teenager, And he says, put out into the deep water. Go a bit further offshore. And let down the nets for a catch. And what always seems to uh, be amazing to me, and I hope it's amazing to you in the Gospels, uh, we have to remember that these were written decades later. And so these are all the stories Uh, that people are still talking about, the things that they remembered most about who Jesus is. And in this instance, we know that it's just Peter and him. And we know that Peter, still decades later, now a leader of the church as it's expanding out into the world, this is one of the conversations he remembers most about his Lord. He remembers when Jesus told him to go out a bit deeper and put down the nets. Put out the nets, Peter. Peter and the other fishers, uh, we know from the uh, story, uh, they had already wrapped up for the day. Uh, They probably spent the whole evening and the early early morning uh, trying to catch fish, and they had been unsuccessful Uh, And so you can imagine them kind of grumbling, probably uh, some choice words, and cleaning the nets after a long day of tiring work of hauling the nets in and out of the water. And Jesus had dozens and dozens of people waiting for the next word that he would speak, and yet he's going out deep into the water away from them so that he can have time alone with just one teenager, one fisherman. He wanted time alone with him. Put out the nets, Peter. Why? Jesus knew that deep down, at this point in Peter's life, this is their first interaction of Jesus meeting Peter, And Peter had been listening to all of Jesus' teaching uh, for that uh, session that he had just had with the the shore uh, crowd. But he didn't really know Jesus. And what we see is that he really didn't trust him. We see that Peter is a skeptic at this point in his life. He doesn't find it easy to put all of his trust in Jesus. He didn't trust him yet. Jesus knew this and he wanted Peter alone so that he could show himself to Peter and prove himself that he really could be Peter's Lord. So put out the nets, Peter. And Simon says this in return. 
Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And you can kind of hear, uh, I apologize to any teenagers that are present, but uh, you can kind of hear uh, a teenage voice in the midst of this. You know what, you know, dad, mom, I'll do this, but only because you say so. I'm not doing it because I want to. Gosh, you know, it's that kind of teenage angst that's built up into Peter's story here. Uh, So it's okay to laugh at scripture sometimes. And we see uh, Peter here who's saying, you know what, if you want me to let down the nets, I've been working all night and all morning, but if you say so, fine, I will. I'm tired, and all, you're, all you'll do is give me another reason to not trust you. And you can imagine that Jesus is reassuring Peter with each syllable of his excuses and all of his frustration, saying, Peter, I know, I know. Would you just trust me. Put out the nets, Peter. Jesus had to get alone with Peter so he could show his face to Peter. You see, you can imagine him having this conversation in the boat as they're setting off for shore, and he's telling him that he wants him to put the nets down one more time. Peter, you, you, you might not trust me yet, but I want you to see me. I want you to look me in my eyes as I'm asking you to do something that seems impossible. And if I'm telling you that you can put the nets down and expect something other than what you've already received, you can trust me. Let me prove myself to you. He wanted him face to face, one on one. So put out the nets. And if you're here today uh, and you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus, or uh, maybe it's that you feel like you've never really had a deeply intimate relationship with Jesus where he has called you by name into this kind of encounter where he wants to be with you one-on-one, and it makes you incredibly uncomfortable at first, and then you grow more comfortable in his presence. If you're here, and and that's your scenario, let me uh, just reassure you again, in case you didn't hear it the first time, that God's greatest desire is for you to know him. God's greatest desire is for you to know him and he will find a way for each and every one of us to sweep all the world aside and get you one-on-one and you have to know him. If he wants you, he will find you. He will put you in a position where you have nothing else to look at but his face and you have to make something of him. He's ever he's either everything or nothing. He will challenge you. And he's challenged me. In the very one particular way that you think it can't be possible that you could trust him. And he will challenge you, asking you, pleading with you to let him prove himself. And if you're here today and you do have a relationship with Christ and you've had those experiences where he's asked you to trust him and you've responded and it's been years or months or even days and you keep plugging along and committing your life over and over to his lordship, if you're anything like me, you've had seasons where it is really easy to forget how God came to us. You see, one of the greatest uh, tragedies that I think uh, you and I could ever fall for 
is the idea that we can learn about God, that we can really enter into his presence by looking for a God that's far off. Like Tozer said, that is uncaring, unmoved, who's callous, who's uh, uninterested, disinterested in everything that you are and everything that's going on in your life. And we settle for other vicarious ways of knowing him. And we listen to the experience of others and we're entirely satisfied by hearing their experience of intimacy with Christ and we're satisfied just to hear their experience. And so we read Christian books and we listen to Christian music and we watch Christian movies and we have Christian friends and we attend church every Sunday And somehow there is a temptation for each and every one of us to believe that that's all it takes to have an intimate relationship with God. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things that I just listed. But if deep down, if that's all that it means for you to know God, then at some point he is going to ask of you in a moment of real desperation in your life, when things seem absolutely impossible and that he can't possibly be asking for what he's asking, when he asks that of you, you will realize that you never really knew him well enough. It won't be difficult to trust him, it will be impossible to trust him. Friends, God desires nothing more than to draw near to us and for us to draw near to him in return. He wants nothing more uh, deeply down in his own heart uh, than to get to know you. And when I say you, I am trying to look at as many individual faces in this room as possible. It's not a broad, generic you, it is you. Not an experience of God through a spouse or your parents. It's not a remembering and clinging on to experience of God in your past. He wants to get to know you, to be face to face with you today. He won't settle for anything less than setting off into deep waters with you and getting to know you so that you can see his face and get to know him in all of the complexity of who he is. Why does he want to get to know you? It's so that when we lose someone we love or when our job applications aren't getting callbacks or when our depression won't lift or when our addictions keep haunting us, It's so that when he approaches you in the midst of all the desperation, all the chaos of life that will inevitably come to you and I, and when he asks you to trust him one more time, you'll know him. You'll know him to be trustworthy. And you'll dare one more time, even if it's just one more time, you will dare to trust him again. So I ask you today, do you know him well enough to trust him in every single instance? After the miracle of the fish uh, and these two boats being weighed down uh, by this miraculous catch of fish, uh, I want to draw your attention to Peter's reaction It says, when Peter saw this, the two boats sinking, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. You see, when, when God drew near to Peter in such a way that he couldn't 
bear to be in his presence. He was so close and he didn't yet trust him and he didn't know what to make of God drawing close to him. The one overwhelming reaction that Peter had was unworthiness. I think the defining uh, note that comes in conversations that I've had with people who are uh, skeptical, that don't find it easy to trust God, is that they keep him at an arm's length because at some point or another they cannot fathom why God would come close to them. And even if the, he might come close to them, it's the, the lack of trust of when he does come close to them, how might he treat them? They're unsure. Peter didn't yet know how to trust God. And you can hear God saying to Peter and to you and to me and everyone else who has a hard time uh, trusting God. Look, I hear what you're saying. I know all the doubts that are deep down settled into you. I know that you might not know why I might come to you. Uh, you might think yourself so untouchable in your sin that you don't know why or how I could come near to you. And then you might not know how I would treat you if I do come near to you. That if I'm powerful enough to, to take fish out of the ocean at just a word of my command, what might I do to a sinner like you? And in the midst of that, in the midst of all the, the doubts that may have settled deeply into our hearts, he is still asking us to trust him. He gets uh, in the boat with us. He wants us one-on-one. -on -one. He wants us to look into his eyes, to feel his face, to put our hands on his cheeks and to, to get to know him, to study him to the point that we do it so often enough that we cannot possibly forget that he is a good God and worthy of our trust. So what breaks down distrust? What would convince you and I if we're not convinced today? Because I'm just getting to know a lot of stories in this room, and I know that there are stories that are deeply difficult and broken. I know that there are areas of trust in the room that are difficult, that don't come easy, whether it's a diagnosis or an addiction or a sadness that doesn't leave, I know that trust doesn't come easy. So how do we break down distrust? Well, let me close with a story. I heard a story recently of a uh, camp of prisoners uh, in the Vietnam War. And they were American soldiers who had been uh, taken prisoner. And for two years, they were imprisoned and they were physically tortured. And they were stripped down and laid on a floor without a bed or anything to lie on. And every day they would come and not only be taunted, but physically hurt. And not just taunted, they were psychologically tortured. What their uh, captors would do is they would ring, ring the alarms of the camp. And they would ring the alarms of the camp and pretend that uh, the Americans had come to free the captives only at the end of the alarms to realize that no one was coming. And they would do this sporadically, raising their hopes and crushing them. They didn't know how to trust whether anybody would ever come for them. And one day, uh, a group of Marines would, were tasked with the uh, mission to go and free uh, these prisoners of war. 
And they get there and they uh, lay siege to the fort and they get into the captives to this room that's cold and bare and they find them all laying in the fetal position on the ground, unable to speak, unable to look at them. And they try to get them to be rescued and they can't. They won't leave the ground. They have built up such a rhythm of distrust, of being rescued, that they couldn't possibly trust the people who were really there to rescue them. And in a, a, a move of compassion uh, and, and a lot of genius brilliance, uh, one of the soldiers, one of the Marines, he actually took off his clothes. And he, could, he crept down onto his hands and knees and he laid on his side on the cold dirt. And for hours, all he did was look them in the eye and reassure them that he was there to rescue them. And hour after hour after hour after hour, eventually, one by one, they got off of the dirt and they were rescued. Brothers and sisters, let's not forget why we just celebrated Christmas. We celebrated Christmas with all the pomp and the circumstance, all the praise that we could lift up to God because God himself took on our very station. And he put on flesh so that he could lay beside us and look us in the eye and allow us to see him face to face so that we could break down all of the moments, big and small, of distrust so that we could trust him over and over and over again that we are being rescued by him. He says the same thing. He does the same thing for you and for me. He says, here I am. I'll come to you because I know that at this point you can't come to me. I'll prove myself to you. I will come face to face. And you've never seen my face before, but now you'll get to see me in the flesh and I will show myself to you and I will prove myself to you. I will show that you can finally trust me and that all the walls of distrust will fall. God face to face is who we have in Jesus. Jesus drew near to Peter one-on-one -on -one and asked Peter to trust him. Put down the nets, Peter. And Peter does. The very end of the passage, it says, they pulled their boats up on the shore and they left every single thing that they had and they followed him. Brothers and sisters, let's not be fooled. Christ came for skeptics like Peter, people who find it difficult to trust in him for all that he says he is. Skeptics like you and I, that when things get really hard and really dark, that we tend to forget how God came near to us in Christ. So I ask these questions, and we're going to take a moment just to pray uh, silently. I ask these questions for you. Where in your own life has God asked you to trust him, but you just cannot? Are you skeptical that God would want to draw near to you? Are you skeptical that if God does draw near that he really will be good toward you. Let's take some time 
uh, just to pray together and then uh, just take some time in silence, you know, consider these questions, how God is calling you to lay everything aside, to follow him and trusting him. And then I'll open our time in prayer uh, for our church, city, and world. Let's pray together.